Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. Um, I'm Ross Virginia. I'm the director of the Dickey Institute of Arctic Studies, which is a program at the Dickey Center for International Understanding. Um, it's really my great honor this evening to introduce today's speaker, Mr. Akalik Linga. Akalik comes to us from Nuuk, Greenland. Um, this lecture is part of a series of, of talks sponsored by the Dickey Center to explore the relationships between climate change and security, security very broadly defined. And I want to thank Professor Darrell Press of War and Peace Studies at Dartmouth in the Government Department um, for actually for, for first proposing and helping develop this lecture series. It's been great to collaborate with them. Um, so far this year, we've had the opportunity to explore the science and environmental consequences of climate change and their political implications. In the spring term, we have several events planned to focus on the politics and economics of climate change. And we'll conclude this series with a panel discussion that looks at some of the policy options that might seek to stabilize the Earth's atmosphere while we adapt to this impending uh, climate change. Um, last June in Greenland, Akaluk hosted a, a, a mini delegation from Dartmouth, and it included Dickey Director Ken Yalowitz, Professors Darren Ranko, Lenore Grenoble, our good friend Marianne Stenbeck from McGill, and myself. And, and we were there with Akaluk to explore mutual interests in building international understanding and human capital to address the pressing issues of climate change. Akaluk is now here at Dartmouth. He's here to continue this initiative as a visiting Dickey Fellow. He's working with the Dickey Center, faculty and students, and other colleagues to promote uh, collaborations with Greenland around the topics of climate change, northern people, and environmental policy. All very good things. Um, we are seeking a partnership that will build a working community that joins Dartmouth with the Inuit Circumpolar Council, the Home Rule Government of Greenland, and colleagues at the University of Greenland. Um, this is a, really an exciting and a very challenging task and opportunity. And we thank Akhluk for his leadership in moving these ideas actually into action. And I, I, those of us that know Akhluk, that's really his trademark, um, ideas into action. Um, Akhluk is truly a world leader. He has represented the Inuit of Alaska, Canada, Greenland, the far east of Russia, as president of the Inuit Circumpolar Council, the ICC. The ICC speaks to the, the interests of the indigenous peoples of the north on a wide range of issues, including climate change, protecting the oceans, whaling, fair exchange of ideas, traditional knowledge and practices, and Arctic pollution issues. At the last ICC General Assembly in Barrow, Mr. Lingo was reappointed president of the ICC Greenland and vice chair for ICC. Now just a little bit about Akluk and how he, he's come to this position and to speak on these issues. Um, he started his professional career as a social worker after graduating from the National Danish School of Social Work in 1976. For several, several years, he started off as a radio broadcaster, and then he entered Greenland politics, where he's been embedded for many, many years. Um, he was first elected to the Greenland Parliament in 1983, and he has served the Greenland government as a member of parliament and a minister of various portfolios. Um, throughout his career, he's, he's really best known, I think, for promoting the rights of indigenous peoples, both in his home country of Greenland and globally. And this has been since his youth. He's demonstrated a very deep commitment to pan-Inuit unity since the early 70s and has been a leader in this, this movement. In recognition of this passionate work and his accomplishments on behalf of human rights, the United Nations has appointed him vice chair of the UN Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues. This is a very significant and important group who advises the UN on all matters of indigenous rights. Um, I think uh, probably one of his crowning accomplishments recently is to see the UN adopt uh, the Declaration on Rights of Indigenous Peoples this past September. He's worked for many years on this task. Um, Akaluk travels widely throughout the Arctic, but all over the world, speaking uh, on human rights, environmental issues, problems of the Arctic, and the challenges for stabilizing the world's climate. Um, most of all, though, he speaks to the humans involved at the center of these issues. Um, among the many people that I know, Akaluk is truly one of the few that are both a scholar and a practitioner. He is well published, having written books of poetry, <coughs> essays, and on politics. He's also contributed to a number of works and anthologies written in English, Greenlandic, 
French and the Nordic languages. So Akalik is known throughout the world. Um, it's been wonderful to see him at the Dickey Center and just to see how busy and how involved he is in so many different aspects of his life. He's currently working on a book of his poems, a book for Inuit youth to help them understand the evolution of the ICC and why it's important to their future. Uh, he's meeting with Dartmouth students, Dartmouth faculty, and he's giving public lectures. It's, it's just an amazing series of activities. Um, those of you that have followed the news of the North and climate change probably saw Akluk popping up in the international press regularly this past summer, especially around the trip he made to England, where he spoke to the people of the United Kingdom about climate change and why it was important and why the ways in which England developed were important to the rest of the world. Um, and when the people of England asked him why they should pay attention to someone from Greenland on this topic, he replied, climate change is not just a theory to us. So it's a real pleasure to have someone speak for the Inuit, to address the Inuit voice, to come from Greenland and talk about change that's occurring there, very rapid um, and significant climate change, and to share his thoughts on, on where we may be headed. Um, I, I must add that, that Akluk is here with his wife, Erna. Um, Erna's not able to be with us this evening, but Erna's a very accomplished uh, television producer and, a, and, and writer dealing with programming about indigenous issues. So let's hear from Akluk. The title of his presentation is Arctic Warming at the Tipping Point, an Inuit Voice. Please join me in a warm welcome for Akluk. <laughs> I would like to thank uh, Dartmouth uh, College, the Dickey Center for International Understanding, and its uh, Institute uh, of uh, Arctic Studies for their kind uh, invitation for me to speak to you today. I would like to especially thank uh, Ambassador Ken Yalovich and Professor Ross Virginia, as well as their staff for the wonderful support they have given me during my stay at Dartmouth. Today, I will speak to you about tipping points and Arctic warming. While I find the concept of tipping point interesting, and while the concept is an interesting way of helping us understand the world we live in, analyzing why things have happened and predicting what might be coming our way, I'm also somebody that strives to see things in context. So in my discussion today, while I will look at some critical points in time, tipping points, I will also discuss what has come before and what might be coming after. Neither can climate change and Arctic clim uh, warming be looked as in uh, isolation? If we are to do something about climate in the Arctic, then the discussion must include the untidy variable of its indigenous peoples, a variable one does, does not have to confront in Antarctica. <laughs> and if uh, scientists and policymakers are to meaningfully include indigenous peoples in the discussion, then we must look back in time to understand who they are, what struggles they have to cope with, and how their successes have come about. It's about making connections. While we all know we are near at or just beyond the climate change tipping point in the Arctic, the key questions revolve around how scientists, policymakers, and indigenous peoples can connect in meaningful and mutually respectful ways in order to deal with the matter at hand. One 
that has indigenous peoples of the Arctic fearful of the future, and Inuit and other indigenous peoples around the world have neither had a great relationship with those that make development and policy discussion decisions about their lands and seas, nor with the scientists and researchers who investigate them. Whether we move back from the Arctic warming tipping point and find ways to mitigate the effects, which is my deepest hope, or whether we move beyond the point of no return and develop adaptation measures, we need the scientific community. And the scientific community needs us. Social and physical scientists have used the concept of tipping point for some time. Malcolm Gladwell uh, popularized the item recently in the best-selling book, and Gladwell argues that little things can make big, big things happen. And as uh, Barry Klasner in the Los Angeles Times book review notes, these little things must sometimes be carefully conceived and ad adeptly enacted for them to produce major consequences for individuals, organizations, and communities. The term tipping point is increasingly being used by those studying the earth climate, and I'm often sent proposals seeking our organization's endorsements or my personal stamp of approval from scientists wanting to drill ice cores in the Greenland ice cap or started the climate in the Arctic in some way or suddenly. I certainly see this term embedded in both the rhetoric and in the science. Timothy Linton and others recently published an article in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Science where they say the term commonly refers to a critical threshold at which a tiny perturbation can qualitatively alter the state or development of a system. It is my hope that together with Ken Yalowicz, Ross Virginia, and others from the Dartmouth College, we can make enough tiny perturbations together to qualitatively change how science is done in Greenland and throughout the Arctic. This is the tipping point that I would especially like to focus on. We have had some important discussions during my time in Dartmouth about exactly this, and I think we are heading in the right direction. Some scientists are catching on to what we mean, and in my opinion, all it now takes is some carefully conceived and adeptly enacted little things to tip the balance towards a human-centered uh, science that works with indigenous peoples, gives back to the community, and incorporates traditional knowledge with full consent. Inuit are people who span a geographical area from Greenland to Arctic Canada to Alaska and the Chukotkan Peninsula of Russia. We are 155,000 strong, have one language, share one lang uh, culture, and approach matters of our collective environment in similar ways. Prior to the 1970s, Inuit were always overlooked by governments and industry, 
when it came to decision making about our territories. Time and time again, political and development decisions were taken and we were not consulted. We did not have a say, and most often these decisions had unwanted and sometimes disastrous effects on us. This applied equally to matters of education, economic development, cultural expression, you name it. We started to organize locally and nationally here and there but then something seemingly small happened, a tipping point, you might say, in 1977, when <clears throat> Eben Hobson, an Inupiaq leader from the North Slope of Alaska, invited a small group of Inuit from Greenland and Canada to meet with Inuit from Alaska. Earlier that decade, spurred on by the oil companies deciding the North Slope of Alaska was theirs and not the indigenous peoples who lived there. Eben Hobson had helped organize a successful response to this huge money grab by big industry. At the 1977 meeting, Inuit shared similar organizing stories and sometimes important happened. The Inuit Circular Conference, now Council, was born. ICC was created to not only foster and celebrate Inuit un unity, something that had eluded us for hundreds of years due to the artificial boundaries drawn among us, but also to work on environment matters that we knew needed a collective response, especially in the Arctic. Since that historic time, ICC has worked on many fronts, working at the international level to make a difference at home. Another earlier tipping point that one must understand before one can appreciate how best to work in the context of today's Arctic is what happened in the 1950s. A convergence of like-minded ideas, discrimination and assimilation policies of governments occurred right across the Arctic and all over the world. While there are numerous accounts of indigenous peoples being maltreated prior to the 1950s, they also were largely ignored. Then something happened. There was a recognition of indigenous peoples in a new way. They were in the way. They needed help. They needed to be eliminated. They needed food. They needed health. Uh, they needed to be integrated into larger society. There were many interests from the outside, some for good and some for bad. At a certain point in time, there was enough momentum for a full assault. Inuit in Canada were forced into boarding schools to be taught the ways of modern Canadians. Cultures were ripped from them. In Greenland, we were sent to Denmark to be schooled, where many lost their languages and their culture. In Chukaka, Russia, Inuit were put in boarding schools as well. While there, hunting rifles were taken from them because of the Cold War was being partly staged 
in the uh, hunting areas of Bering Sea with Soviet and American guns pointing at each other. So, other stories like the northern Quebec uh, Inuit that were forcibly relocated to Ellesmere Island in the high Arctic so Canada could claim sovereignty over the area. Greenland Inuit were evicted from their houses in Umanak, North Greenland, and from th their ancestral hunting grounds, given tents and told to go away. All this so, the U.S. Thule Air Base could be constructed with Danish permission and support. The air base is still in existence today and continues to run on New York time and is off limits to the hunters that harvested the sea and lands there forever. This paternalistic attitude spread like wildfire and somewhere in that decade, one is sure to find a tipping point. I have yet to locate it, and I've looked hard. And given the sudden, almost combined movements of assimilation and relocations among nations, there has be to be a point that made a difference. Well, the 1960s was pretty much the status quo, although the governments of Canada finally decided to give its indigenous peoples the vote in the early part of that decade. In the late 1960s and early 1970s, small indigenous organizing movements started to form. In Copenhagen, where I was a student, I personally organized marches into the ministries of the Danish government in Copenhagen to protest the educational system that forced Greenlandic kids to go to school in Denmark, across the Atlantic, away from their parents. We arranged meetings to educate the Danes about the assimilation process in Greenland that was destroying our culture. We pushed for more autonomy for Greenland, which did eventually happen in 1979, through the establishment of the Home Rule government. We learned from a similar protest in the northern part of Alaska where the Inupia Eskimos, as they call themselves over there, and who are the Inuit of that area, fought the oil companies and governments who were rubber stamping industry's desire for free and up, unobstructed access to petroleum resources. The result was that the Inuit there two formed a type of semi-autonomous uh, government called the Norslo Borough. Many movements also started in Canada, which led to land claim settlement that started in 1976 with the Inuit of Northern Quebec negotiating and settling with the Canadian government and ended with a Labrador Inuit, who only two years ago concluded their land claims process. This were many other indigenous movements. There was many other indigenous movements around the world, which awakened during that period. Some were more successful than others. However, the Scandinavian Samis the indigenous peoples of Scandinavia, for example, organized and demanded that their rights be respected. And today, they have their own parliaments and have direct input to their respective governments. 
the Sami of the Kola Peninsula and the Inuit of Tukotka in the former Soviet Union, on the other hand, had less success. The enthusiasm and optimism of that period allowed me, in spite of the closed doors in the Soviet Union, to put much energy into bringing the Siberian Yupik or Russian Inuit into the ICC fold. Inuit from Tugaka could not even be invited to the historic meeting, United Inuit in 1977. And every three years when ICC held its General Assembly, an empty chair was placed at the table to symbolize the absence. After I became an ICC Executive Council member and uh, vice president of that organization, I went to Moscow several times to plead their case. I told the Soviet officials about my trips across the Arctic in 1978, where I visited as many Inuit villages in the Arctic as I could. And that I told them that I believed in connections, connections among Inuit, but also between indigenous peoples and governments such as Canada, Denmark, United States, and the Soviet Union. Just as most people never imagined the collapse of the Soviet Union, and certainly never thought it would happen so quickly, so too did many believe that Inuit on the other side of the Cold War never be reunited with their cousins in the American side of the Bering Strait. Well, in 1992, they joined us at the ICC table. The success of Inuit and ICC and others could not have happened without a global indigenous movement. This too took hold everywhere. We worked together realizing that we all had similar stories of oppression to tell. And we shared our successes. We hardly knew each other in the 1960s and certainly in 1950s. We were simply, each of us, struggling against oppression, in some cases starvation, genocide, and other unspeakable atrocities. Many things happen to produce this global movement. I, ha I have given you a flavor, a little flavor of it today. What I would say was the tipping point in this era where the clock could no longer be turned back was the 1975 historic meeting of various global indigenous leaders held in Port Alberni, British Columbia, in Canada. I was present at that meeting and I was quite amazed <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> I was uh, quite amazed how similar each of us, our stories were. We were from all corners of the globe, and yet we understood each other. And we promised to work together from then on. This did not mean we were all one people as current governments and international organizations want us to be. We still possess flourishing, diverse, and vibrant elements of our cultures and unique economies. And now we often have to resist governments 
from wanting us to speak only with one voice. A one-stop shop, to say, to, so to say. I say that we are still flourishing, but more accurately, I should say that some of us are. Sorry, I had to have uh, some water. <coughs> many, many of us indigenous peoples around the globe have lost our languages. Our cultures have disappeared. And others are simply being er eradicated. We share all these stories and we resolve to continue to meet. A global indigenous people's movement was born that can never again be silenced. Other important milestones happened following that. They are too nu numerous to mention. But in 1992, the Vienna World Conference on Human Rights was held. There were, we met and agreed to push for a high level United Nations body that would put indigenous peoples front at the bottom lost in the huge, and not lost at the bottom on the huge United Nations uh, bureaucracy. Six years ago, after a decade of organized work and focused resolve, we established the United Nations Permanent Forum on Indigenous Peoples Issues. Here, eight Indigenous nominated members sit equal to eight member states uh, nominated members. And together, these 16 members, we listened to thousands of indigenous individuals and organizations that come to the United Nations headquarters every year for three weeks. The permanent forum, as we call it, uh, makes decisions and recommendations that are directly made to the president of the ECOSOC, the United Nations Economic and Social Committee, which in turn reports to the General Assembly and the governments of various states. Still more, <coughs> we have the uh, we have the adoption of the Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples to celebrate. This was a crowning achievement of more than 24 years of work by international movement. While we had to face insults and opposition from Australia, New Zealand, United States, Russia, and Canada, we choose to focus on the overwhelming support the declaration received from most of the UN member states. This happened only a few months ago in September 2007. I don't know where or when the next tipping point will appear. Perhaps it is the recent election of a different government in Australia which may be a small thing in the large scheme of things. But the first order of business was a heartfelt apology from Australia to its indigenous peoples, the Aboriginal people, for the centuries of oppression and suffering they have endured. That brings us today on the issue of 
warming of the Arctic. It is not hard to see that we are again at a crucial point in our history and near a tipping point and that our Arctic environment has in fact many tipping points. We are easier to predict than, uh, some are easier to predict than others. It makes sense to most people that once permanent snow cover melts in summer, then the darker earth below will absorb more heat, which in turn will accelerate the heating and the melting even more. It is not hard to see that certain Arctic species are near their tipping points and that only a small stressor will push them to the brink. It is this certain, however, which way some species are tipping. Some will survive well and may have already adapted as far as we know, time will tell. It is not hard to see that uh, Greenland's most spectacular fjord, the Illulisat ice fjord, may be in trouble and at a point where it can't recover. Again, we are not certain, but we are a little bit scared. Disco Bay, where I grew up, that's where it is. It is the country for millions and millions of pieces of ice that originally in the Illulisat ice fjord and eventually rocked their way out to the Davis Strait and North Atlantic Ocean. The Illulisat ice fjord has been a UNESCO World Heritage Site since 2004 because even for some like me who grew up in the region, the fjord packed full of gigantic iceberg is a breathtaking sight to behold. The Sommerguyetlok, which uh, the fjord ice is called, feeds the whole fjord. Sommerguyetlok makes its way from Greenland's ice cap and falls a gravity inches its way over the edge when it breaks off and thunderously plunks into the sea below. The mighty glacier is now melting at an unprecedented rate. Not only are large icebergs breaking off the edge, but water is pouring over it as well. It was, I want to tell you uh, with one comment here before I, I uh, end uh, this, this one. Um, those of you who can read uh, Danish uh, will be able to understand this one. But Matt, uh, my, my helper this uh, morning was so good at arranging the whole thing here. So uh, sorry that uh, I, I don't have a, uh, um, done so well while I'm uh, speaking because uh, uh, sometimes um, it's a, a little uh, distracting also to use that. But I think we must say today and ask ourselves which way is my Inuit homeland? tipping. Well, according to the latest assessment report of the UN uh, Intergovernmental governmental panel on climate change, there is now unequivocal evidence that the Earth climate system is warming 
and in the panel's words, it is very likely due to greenhouse gas emissions. Without mitigation strategies, the IPCC predicts that the Earth air temperature will increase by 2 to 4.5 Celsius by the end of 21st century. This in turn will result in a sea level rise of at least 18 to 58 centimeters. Temperature increases in the Arctic will be even more extreme when they are expected to rise five to seven degrees in the same period. Thus far, climate change has been felt mostly, most intensely in the Arctic. The average Arctic temperature has risen twice as much as the global temperature in the past few decades. In summer 2007, the polar ice cap shrunk to the smallest size ever, ever seen in satellite images, opening previously ice, jam, uh, ice, uh, ice jammed areas. So we now know that even a chance for the opening of the Northwest Passage will be uh, able for navigation by year 2012. We have a project in the ICC that focuses on Greenland hunters, asking them to document what climate change effects they have seen over their lives and what information they have clean from their parent, grandparents. It is also a project that explains to hunters and fishermen what is being done both globally and in Greenland with respect to mitigation efforts and today adaptation research. Hunters speak of thinning ice that makes hunting much more dangerous and chances to permafrost that alter spring run patterns, a northward shift in seal and fish species, and rising sea levels with more extreme tidal fluctuations. In Canada, in the northern part of Canada, the Inuit village of Tuktoyaktuk is experiencing great erosion along its shoreline, which in turn is causing additional water problems where a channel is now separating two sides of this little town. There are numerous other examples, such as this in Alaska and across the Arctic. It is well documented that as the Greenland ice cap melts, the shores of small island developing states will increasingly be flooded as global sea levels rise. So others in the world will be affected as well. We are all connected. In conclusion, I have a message to both the scientists here and the students. We need your help in dealing with the warming Arctic. We need help in developing mitigation measures and in helping us learn how to adapt to those parts of the Inuit lands and seas that are already past the tipping point. And my message go further. We need a different approach. The 1800s will be remembered as a century of great Arctic explorers and one of greater colonization. The 1900s, a century of great scientific investigations. Both centuries failed, however, to recognize the value 
of the indigenous peoples of the Arctic. Let's do little things together which will help make this current century one of connection, one of working collectively in which the scientific community doesn't just come to Greenland and other parts of the Arctic to undertake research that is only of interest to it. We have to stop this colonial attitude. I want to thank, once again, Kenneth Yalowitz and Ross Virginia in working with us on tipping the attitude towards one of cooperation and away from unilateral research. I am very optimistic and excited that they are listening and they have demonstrated their willingness to work with our students in Greenland to understand how traditional knowledge may be incorporated into research of the Thicke Center and to stay in touch, you might say. Let us promote a change in climate of another kind. Let us break down the ethnic and cultural differences, not by eliminating them, but by, exchanging among, but by exchanging among them. Let us together break down the misunderstanding and ignorance. We will be successful in battling climate change, I'm sure, if we continue the cooperation and the dialogue we already have started. Thank you. Is it on? Okay. Um, so in the end, you spoke about uh, the research and how um, the scientists should be coming to do research that doesn't only involve um, their interests. So I'm just kind of curious as to what research you're suggesting they should be doing and should start doing and should start kind of um, not advertising but um, spreading their research results to the rest of the world. I think it's a, a general problem that uh, if you look at the, uh, the United Nations uh, work on the uh, climate change, which uh, over 300 uh, scientists have, uh, have been uh, doing for the last uh, uh, at least uh, 15 years, that uh, there is a gap uh, between the scientific world uh, the, uh, uh, and uh, the people uh, themselves not only uh, uh, the decision makers. Uh, uh, we have a difficulty in uh, politicians that don't understand the science and uh, try to put their own beliefs of whatever can they are. If the world are going to understand each other and we are, are going to, to uh, have a, a, a real dialogue, then we have to have uh, one uh, <clears throat> starting point, which is the scientific uh, evidence of what's uh, going on in the world in any aspect. I can tell you that uh, in the old days, uh, we didn't ask a, a, a biologist uh, when to go to hunt. We had our own system. But now, what we are doing in our organization is uh, to take out, to travel long ways this summer to uh, Chile to talk uh, with a big meeting called the International Whaling Commission to try and get a few quotas of whales that I will show you here, humpback whales that uh, uh, I, I show you. There's a lot of them. <laughs> there's, there's so much of them. And then uh, we are only allowed, uh, we have uh, around 200,000 um, 
uh, minke whales uh, in the uh, uh, North Atlantic alone, and Greenlanders are allowed to catch 175 each year. So, and then around the Davis Strait, we have a one species of seal, four million, and then we get uh, 200,000 each year. But you still have many other peoples around. This is scientific uh, uh, things, and uh, we go to the uh, North uh, Atlantic Marine Mammal Commission to meet and go return to Greenland and tell the hunters uh, what's going on there. And then this is scientific evidence. But you will still have uh, very uh, large groups internationally that are fighting. Uh, they call themselves, uh, some of them call themselves uh, uh, animal rights movement, but they are not building their uh, attitudes towards uh, uh, conservation in a manner uh, that, uh, that are based on scientific facts. In many times, those uh, um, campaigns that are going on will hit the indigenous peoples. Most of the time, because we don't, it doesn't get out. So I think, uh, like uh, uh, Schneider, that I heard uh, a month ago talking about uh, climate change, that uh, we should be much, much better in uh, communicating what uh, the science facts are uh, to uh, all people and make sure that communities, uh, our own areas uh, that are affected of, uh, of the changes that are taking place, that uh, we also have in a project like we have uh, with the Deke Center, we are approaching that directly. Because in my opinion, when uh, we, you drill in the middle of uh, the Greenland ice cap, you get a lot of information and to go back here in our neighborhood. Uh, you will have uh, big studies and Mary over here is uh, doing it, I know. But, uh, well, that's what we can tell the rest of the, the world what's happening. But try and go to the uh, uh, fjord, uh, not far from the Inuit ice fjord, and tell uh, the, uh, the uh, hunters and fishermen what they can do when the ice is away, when, uh, uh, when uh, the, the weather patterns uh, change so much. So the traditional uh, weather forecasting doesn't exist anymore. So we are losing a lot of information there because uh, we are drilling in, in the uh, uh, ice core and not uh, uh, going uh, to the uh, area where people live also. I think we all have uh, this obligation uh, to tell the uh, uh, Greenlandic people and the Arctic peoples and the Inuit all over the Arctic how that would affect uh, their own environment. Because we don't have that information. Because you don't go to the people that have the knowledge. So I think that's how I was telling the whole story about the history of, uh, of the indigenous people's uh, movement, that I, I think uh, that uh, this is what we are doing here at this moment in Dartmoor, and uh, I'm sure that uh, it will help a lot all over uh, the, the, the world if uh, the scientific community uh, also allow itself to think uh, uh, not only this way, but uh, in a broader sense uh, 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 for the people uh, where they get uh, the information and never return it. That's what I mean. And I think uh, that the Dartmoor College and the, especially the Dickey Center is, uh, is on the right direction here. President Linka, um, unfortunately, there are disenfranchised indigenous people in many, many parts of the world. 
uh, as, as a leader in the struggle for uh, civil rights and human recognition for the Inuit people, what would you have to advise other people in the world who have similar plights to your own people's? Well, uh, hopefully, uh, most uh, of the decision makers around the world are now uh, in a process to understand uh, the, uh, the climate uh, changes uh, happening right now, and also in this area, <laughs> um, that, uh, that we, do, we do something uh, what we can do uh, personally is, uh, is uh, one question which is uh, very important. But on the other hand, we have the technology already at hand. If we use that uh, correctly, we shouldn't uh, have a, a 400 uh, uh, cold uh, powered uh, uh, um, power plants uh, uh, in this uh, country. So uh, uh, I think um, it's uh, your your question is, is more that uh, we are trying to use the United Nations uh, through that system. We uh, are trying to influence the government's decisions and also taking into account uh, that every place you are every conflict area in the world, that's where the indigenous peoples live. For many years, I knew that there was a big uh, uh, war in uh, Vietnam, but uh, only four years ago, when I was called to a meeting in The Hague, uh, I met uh, the uh, uh, indigenous peoples uh, of uh, uh, some areas of where the fighting took place in the 60s and 70s, and they were caught in the middle of the, Rush, uh, the uh, U.S. Uh, uh, and uh, the North Vietnamese uh, forces, and they don't belong, belong to that area anymore. In many uh, his, uh, stories that, that, I, that I hear, uh, indigenous peoples are the most uh, marginalized uh, people, and their history are not known. And I think uh, what we should uh, do is uh, that uh, uh, scientists that have knowledge of any kind, uh, when they are working in the areas where, where the, uh, we live, uh, that um, uh, try and connect and try uh, and start a, a, a dialogue uh, and also uh, uh, channel, that's uh, what we are doing, the channel the knowledge that is already there into our own area because uh, um, only 40% uh, <clears throat> uh, in our area uh, speak uh, another language, uh, uh, which is uh, Danish, and 60% uh, uh, is uh, 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 speaking uh, the Grenadic Inuit language. So in many times, you will have uh, to have several languages before you reach uh, have to go through uh, that process for a long time. And uh, for us that are lucky enough uh, uh, to have the gift uh, to speak uh, several languages, uh, uh, we do a lot. Uh, uh, but uh, I don't speak the 6,700 uh, languages spoken around the world. <laughs> every, day, every second uh, uh, week, uh, uh, a language uh, dies. Uh, and uh, I think the situation that we see it uh, from our uh, perspective is uh, sometimes uh, overlooked and uh, it takes a while before a real understanding can, can uh, uh, take place. Uh, think of, of uh, the Australians, uh, uh, how many years it took them uh, just to say sorry well, you can say sorry, but uh, you, if you don't change uh, the way you deal with indigenous peoples, uh, then we don't change anything. That's where the sciences, the community belongs. Uh,
elsewhere. Uh, uh, I think uh, that uh, a real a dialogue uh, that uh, we are uh, trying to start here would be uh, a good uh, stepping stone. I hope uh, that uh, your questions, uh, your question, part of your question was uh, answered here.